Thank you. I have a disturbing vision. It's a vision about the way your vision is disturbed. And you'll see what I mean as I progress. If I was to show you a photograph of a road traffic accident, you'd find it unpleasant. You'd find it unpleasant because of the pain and suffering that the photograph represents. But there are images I could show you that you'd find uncomfortable, not because of what they represent, but because of what they are. I'll show you an example, but I'm only going to show it for a short time, because some of you will find this quite uncomfortable. You may find that the image is unstable. It appears to shimmer, move around. And those of you with migraine will find it particularly uncomfortable. I haven't shown it for very long because there are a few of us who are liable to a seizure when they look at an image of this kind. Extraordinary. Why? Well, our visual systems developed in the natural world to process natural images. And natural images have a particular spatial structure. They're scale invariant. And that means that <coughs> no matter how much you blow them up, you still have the same amount of detail. Imagine, for example, you've got a map of a coastline. The number of wiggles in the coastline doesn't change with the scale of the map, because as the scale gets larger, so you see more details. It's the same with natural images. And <coughs> the brain can process these very efficiently. It does so using only a few neurons at any particular time, less than 15% or so. Now, people with migraine are particularly susceptible to these patterns, as I've already mentioned. And if you measure the amount of oxygenation of their brain when they look at these patterns, you find it's large, larger than normal. So the uh, uncomfortable patterns are producing an abnormally large usage of oxygen by the brain. Both in terms of the differences between people, which I've mentioned, also the differences between images, uncomfortable images are associated with a large use of oxygen by the brain. Now, <coughs> as I say, the brain uses an awful lot of energy, maybe 15 to 20% of the body's energy is used by the brain. So it makes sense to conserve it. So perhaps the discomfort we experience when we look at these disturbing geometric patterns is actually protective, homeostatic, in the same way as pain is. I mean, you withdraw your hand from a sharp or uh, a hot object to protect your body. Maybe you avert your gaze from these unpleasant images uh, to protect your brain, as it were, to reduce the amount of energy usage by the brain. Unfortunately, our modern urban environment is quite unlike the natural environment. And there are patterns of this kind everywhere you look. And I'm just going to show you a few examples. But they are everywhere. The, here's a, a, a mat. Look at the uh, pattern of the lights. Um, you might fall down these stairs, unless you're careful. Um, and uh, everywhere we look in <coughs> buildings, we'll find stripes of one kind or another. Now, it turns out that we can predict how uncomfortable these images are using a computer. All we need to do is get the computer to see how close to scale invariance the images are. And that, believe it or not, predicts and provides a very good prediction for how uncomfortable you and I will find an image. It could be, a, it could be any image, photograph, artwork, uh, artificial image, doesn't matter. You can predict how uncomfortable it is simply from this computer algorithm. And so we'll find, I think, it'll be quite useful for designers in the future. Now, of course, we can avert our gaze from uncomfortable patterns well, for the most part, we can. But unfortunately, there are some that we have to look at. Now, if you're a musician, you have to look at the lines of the stave. Now, it may surprise you to learn that um, we found that if the lines of the stave are printed fairly thickly, as they often are, you make twice as many sight reading errors as you do when the lines are printed in a thin line. <coughs> a huge effect. Just from the uh, strength of the pattern. But there's another pattern you have to look at every day, 
you probably don't think of it as a stripe pattern, uh, it's text. Text is a stripe pattern. You've got the horizontal rows of the words. And if you cover up, you might like to try this, if you cover up the lines you're not reading, leaving three or f maybe two or three lines uncovered in the middle, some of you will find that that makes the text clearer, easier to read. And that's because you're covering up the unnecessary stripes. And this was discovered in 1890 by a chap called Prentice. He called it a typoscope, this simple little mask. Well, it, it works, it's a nuisance to use, but it works. But unfortunately, it only works for some of the stripes because there's other stripes in text that you're probably not aware of. Um, consider the word mum. Mum. It's a series of vertical strokes. Those strokes uh, Im impair your vision. It takes you 10% longer to read striped words like mum than it does unstriped words like dad. It takes you a lot longer. Why is that? Well, it's because <coughs> when you read, you don't move your eyes smoothly along a line of text. Instead, you're moving them in a series of jerks that you're not aware of. They're called saccades. And after each jerk of the eyes, you, your brain has to realign the eyes because they go out of alignment during the saccade. You, your brain has to realign the eyes each time it lands on a new word. <coughs> and um, to do so, uh, it takes more information when the word is striped. It takes the brain longer to make the alignment because the alignment has to be more precise. It has to be more precise because of the ambiguity in the image. Now, uh, so text is difficult for both the eyes and the brain, but it's made more difficult than it needs to be. Uh, when we learn to read, we read text that's nice and large, but it gets smaller as we get older until by the age of 10 we're reading text that's designed for adults. We've shown that text gets too small too early in life. And this compromises reading speed, children's comprehension of text. And in fact, if you're a teacher and you want to demonstrate this, you can just take a reading test where the text will be set out in lines that gradually decrease in size and make a version of the text which don't, doesn't decrease in size, stays the same large size throughout, and you'll find that on average you increase the reading age by about five months. So text is getting too small for children too early in life. We need books that are <coughs> larger. We also need to redesign our fonts so that they're less stripy. And we can do that now using a, a computer technique. So this will probably help designers in the future. But some children, when they look at a page of text, they say that it seems to move around. The letters seem to wobble, shimmer, fly off the page. Exotic um, perceptual phenomena that are rather reminiscent of the distortions you see in a pattern of stripes. Perhaps it's unsurprising, given that text is a pattern of stripes. Well, for some extraordinary reason that we don't quite understand, uh, if you cover the page of text with a colored sheet of plastic, and you get the color right, uh, then the child can report that the distortions have disappeared and their reading speed takes off. It's quite astonishing the first time you witness this. There's a child struggling to read, haltingly from the white page. You place a sheet of colored plastic over the page, and their reading just becomes fluent and takes off. There's about one child in every class that's affected in this way. Why? Why should color have this extraordinary effect? Well, we've just been looking at patterns of stripes that are colored. So we've taken a pattern of stripes made out of red and blue, red and blue stripes, or let's say yellow and orange, yellow and orange stripes. And we find that the larger the difference in color, the more uncomfortable the pattern is. It doesn't matter what colors. So for example, a red and a blue stripes are quite different in color, aren't they? But so, so is a purple and a green color. It doesn't matter what colors you choose. What it does matter is how far apart they are, how different they are. And the more different the colors are, the more uncomfortable 
the pattern is. But it's not only discomfort, we've also measured the oxygenation of the brain. And we find that the uncomfortable patterns increase the amount of oxygen used by the brain. So once again, we've got uncomfortable patterns producing a large oxygenation of the brain. And, <coughs> um, and so uh, the, uh, the oxygen usage is, in essence, a, a measure of the inefficiency of the brain's processing. And of course, in nature, we don't get images that have very large color differences. So once again, we've got unnatural images, large color difference, discomfort. Now, remember I said that a colored filter can sometimes help these children to see text. Well, if you're looking through a colored filter, you're reducing the color differences. You're increasing some color differences, admittedly, but most you're reducing. And maybe this is one of the reasons why colored filters help. It can't be the whole story, though, because we know that the color has to be just right for the person. We don't know why. It's very frustrating. But um, we do know that that's the case. Just recently, we've asked people with migraine to look at a pattern of stripes and to look at them through differently colored filters. And we find that if we use a filter that has the right color for that individual, we can normalize, we can um, reduce the amount of oxygenation in the brain. So we've made the, the brain function more normally. Uh, it only works with the right color. If you, the color is slightly different, inappropriate for that individual, not reported to be so comfortable, then it doesn't work. So we've got a long way to go to explain why we get these large individual differences, but we know that color can have these beneficial effects. So to summarize, then, I've, I've, I've explained that there are, there are a lot of striped patterns in our environment, and that they can and, and do cause problems. Um, why is it that there are so many patterns of stripes everywhere we look? Is it partly because designers like to strike the eye? Maybe. But I think it's also because it's cheaper and easier to build uh, projects with repetitive similar elements. Um, but whatever the reason, I think we should think again about the design of our environment and make it more like that in nature so that we have fewer stripes to look at. After all, we've known for a long time that nature is restorative. It's nice to go for a walk in the woods. It makes you feel better. And I think one of the reasons is you're not having to look at stripes the whole time. Thank you. <laughs>